Hey everybody, baseball is almost here and this is the Phillies Talk Podcast. I'm Corey Sabin, he's Ricky Vitalico, our producer is Spencer McCurchill. Spencer McCurchill, we'll hear from him a little bit later in the show. Uh, opening day, Ricky, later this week. We don't know 100% whether it's going to be Thursday because it looks like there's some uh, rain in the forecast here in the Northeast, but uh, the Phillies are ready to go. They are done in Florida. They came north. They appear to have their roster and we're going to talk about all these different roster decisions uh, starting in center field, where it appears that Johan Rojas is the everyday center fielder. The Phillies are not going to carry him to sit him on the bench, so it appears that he's going to get the regular duty there in center. Christian Pache made the team, and Jake Cave was traded. So what did you make of all those outfield moves uh, leading into opening day? The, the, all right, let's start with the Jake Cave thing. Not surprising. Uh, I think that kind of tells you that they probably weren't going to keep him, and the best way to – exit him out of here was to get a trade and get nothing really for him. But I mean, in reality, if you're not going to use the guy, let him go somewhere else. And that's exactly what the Phillies did there. I don't think that's a surprise. I know a lot of people say, well, where's the lefty on the bench? And then my answer to that would be, well, when would you have used them anyways? Maybe the nine spot. And that's about it uh, with this Phillies lineup. Uh, number two, let's, let's go to the Johan Rojas thing. And the one thing about Johan Rojas is he's going to save runs. I think we all agree with that. I mean, not only can he come in on a baseball, he could also go gap to gap. He's great instinct-wise uh, with the ball off the bat. He does a little bit of everything in center field. So I think for the pitching, I mean, if you were to ask Aaron Nola, if you were to ask Zach Wheeler, I think they'd tell you, hey, Johan Rojas is, is my best bet to have out in center field. The argument there would be, well, you know what? He doesn't hit. He, he's he's he doesn't get on base enough. Blah blah blah. I will ask you to go back to 2008 and take a good look at at if you remember they had a catcher, Carlos Ruiz. You remember that? Okay. Well, go ahead and look at Carlos Ruiz's number from the 2008 season. Uh, you don't always need nine hitters up and down the lineup. In this case, you have eight. And if Rojas gives you anything out of the nine spot, it's just going to be beneficial to the team. Um, you go back to that 2018, they had a pitcher hitting in the nine spot. And Carlos Ruiz also in that lineup. So, and, and Pedro Feliz, who didn't exactly, you know, rip the cover off the ball all the time. So I don't have a problem with what they're doing going a little bit defensively. I think that's a, that's a great move by the Phillies. Yeah, it's a good pull by you to bring up Chooch from 2008. You know, Phillies fans remember the offensive player that he became later in his career, but that year he hit 219 with a 320 on base percentage, and that might be what you're looking at from Johan Rojas. I mean, you talk about that they don't need a hitter in the nine spot. What, what would cause this to be an issue is if he's hitting like 160 and not getting on base. You know, that's when it might reach – um, decision-making time. But barring that, you know, the Phillies are going to give Rojas the ability to, to kind of sink or swim here. You asked the question, who would have been, like, when are you going to need to use the left-handed bat off the bench? I guess the time that that would come up would be on nights where Rojas starts in center and Marsh is in left, which you figure happens a lot, and it's the eighth inning of the game and it's 4-4 and Johan Rojas comes up with a runner on third and one out or something like that. So in that spot, that's where I guess the Phillies could have turned to a left-handed bench bat, but I guess they're looking at this as in that spot they would go to a Whit Merrifield or a Christian Pache from the right side, so it wouldn't be you know a platoon advantage with the lefty against the righty, but they may have also just weighed that J.K. from the left side wasn't a meaningful enough offensive upgrade in that situation either. Yeah, I, I mean, like to me, you're talking about Jake Cave here. I, I mean, you look at his numbers from last year, he had five home runs last year. And, and my biggest thing was, did he have a memorable one? And I tick-tock, tick-tock. I couldn't think of one off of the top of my head. So, you know, my my theory is if you're going to have a left-handed hitter off the bench, it's a bopper. I, I mean, it's a guy that's going to come in, swing for defenses, and that's that. And you really don't have that within this organization right now. So they stick to their guns. They're, they're going to use different guys off the bench, like you brought up Merrifield. Merrifield could hold his own. I don't care who he's facing. He's a veteran player that understands how to hit. He understands how to have good at bats. So I, I'm I'm good with that for now. And I've said this uh, from the beginning of spring training that I really believe that you need that extra left-handed bat. Well, that's what trades are for. And at some point during the season, I'm sure the Phillies will make some kind of trades, whether it be at the trade deadline before 
before it. I don't know. It's just one of those things where if that need comes up and it's visible and it's and it's glaring, I think Dave Dombrowski will make some kind of a move. Yeah, and plus David Dahl and Cal Stevenson, two other left-handed hitting outfielders, remain in the organization. They're going to begin at AAA. The Phillies could pluck them at any point if they feel that that's a need. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, like you said, Ricky, we're talking about like the 10th and 11th pieces on the offense. There are a lot of teams that wish that they were – in a position where the biggest question mark was like the 10th or 11th guy uh, position player wise. But that then leads us to the pitching staff where, you know, last week we sat here and we talked about the concern level over Taiwan Walker, who velocity was down in spring training and he had an unusual ramp up, didn't make a full series of starts in camp. And lo and behold, now he has shoulder issues that he's dealing with and does not look like he's going to be helping the Phillies out the early part of the season in April, Spencer Turnbull, is going to be in that season opening rotation in the number five spot. Turnbull looks pretty good. He's looked pretty good this spring. We've seen some movement from him. We've seen some swing and miss. He's a guy who has a lot to prove after uh, the way things ended in Detroit, where he had multiple uh, like tiffs with the Tigers over whether he was injured or whether he was going to be optioned without an injury back to the minors. So he likes the situation he's in now. But the Taiwan Walker situation, four years, $72 million. Year one was rocky. It was up and down. And now you're too off to an uh, inauspicious start. Starting to look a lot like the Jake Arietta signing is exactly what it's starting to look like. Um, you know, Taiwan Walker, I, I, you know, it's not really surprising with the arm problems. And the reason why I say that is in velocity problems, because we've seen that in the past, too. When you throw so many split fingers, that puts a lot of pressure on your arm, puts a lot of pressure on your elbow, a lot of pressure on your shoulder. And sooner or later, you, you just your body can't take it anymore. I'm starting to wonder if all that wear and tear from I mean, think about it. He's, he's like a 40 percent split finger guy. You can you throw it that much. And sooner or later, you know, time catches up to you. Pitches catch up to you. Your bullets catch up to you. It's a lot of everything. So. Right now, I look at it this way. Okay, he's not in the lineup right now. He's not in the rotation right now. You bring in Turnbull. That's step number one of your depth chart, and that's something the Phillies have a little bit of in starting pitching. So, you know, you, you look at this and say, you know injuries are going to happen. You know things are going to happen where you're going to need starters. Well, the Phillies, it just so happens to be that it's at the beginning of the season, which I think that's almost a blessing in disguise. You'd rather have something happen right away uh, where – it happens before opening day, then this happening in May, June, or July. Yeah, you know, the Taiwan Walker contract, I think that's the one here that the Phillies probably regret a year later, four years, $72 million. I mean, they're not, it's not like they're um, ceasing spending in other places, but you just think about what that money could have bought in addition to like what it's got in the Phillies. I mean, there's still a lot, a lot of contract left for Taiwan Walker, three full seasons left, but uh, it, it hasn't gotten out to the star that he or the team would have wanted here so far in 2024 when he was hoping to uh, make a new impression. But Citizens Bank Park is going to be making a bit of a new impression this year. There are some new things to know about at the ballpark, the right field scoreboard, for example. And uh, Spencer, our producer, was over at CBP earlier this week to learn about some of the new things. What, what stuck out to you, Spence? Hey, guys. Uh, how's it going? Um, yeah, you know, it was interesting. Uh, had a great time yesterday. Uh, had our guy Alex Ruain with us, Brooke Destra. Um, had a good time over at the ballpark. A lot of good food. Uh, but I think the thing that kind of stuck out the most was everyone is it doesn't seem too happy about this right field out-of-town scoreboard. Um, I thought it looked great. Um, so it, it kind of looks like there's going to be, you know, four teams at once. They're going to rotate, you know, or four games at once, and then they'll rotate in through. Uh, a lot of ad space in there as well. But I know there was a lot of pushback on Twitter um, with some people just saying it kind of takes away that retro feel. Um, but other than that, I thought the ballpark looked great. It smelled, you know, you guys know when you walk in there, it's got those smells right away. It's the best thing in the world. Um, a lot of good food, too. We're introducing the Schwarberger 2.0, uh, which was delicious. Yeah, Ricky fired up about that one. Um, there's a few other things there that uh, I, you know, I'm not going to say which ones I didn't like or, or did like, but uh, there was some some factors that I didn't like there. But uh, Rick and Corey, I kind of want to get your opinion, too. And obviously, going to the ball game, <clears throat> we kind of in the media wise, you know, we kind of get lucky sometimes with the, the meal and stuff. But if you're going to a game as a fan, what's that thing that you guys are looking forward to? Like, are we getting dogs? Are we getting burgers? Are we getting pretzels? What do we got? Wow, that's a heck of a question. It is because I don't. 
All right. Well, I, I, when I was a kid, it was definitely hot dogs. I mean, I always wanted hot dogs at the ballpark. And that, that kind of still sticks a little bit now. I don't eat the hot dogs as much as I used to. But I, you know what? That's a really good question. I would probably say a little Manco and Manco pizza. Good. And we're back I, I, here. I guess that, that would be my go-to right now. I mean, uh, you know, when we go in the suite, they have those the, those hot dogs that are that, that are nice, nice cooked, well cooked. They have the little sliders. So, I mean, we have, we have a little bit of everything, but I, I, I got to go with the with the pizza. There's something about being in a ballpark, and even if it's like the nastiest type of hot dog, you still have to eat the hot dog. It's just, it just feels right. I'd probably say a hot dog, give me a nice beverage. But the most important thing to me is just the vantage point. I hate like I, it's been many years since I've been to a game as a fan at this point, but like when I used to go with my friends and they would want to get there and go in, go into the game in like the second or third inning. And it's like, what are you, what are we doing here? This isn't, this isn't, you know, college football. You don't tailgate. <laughs> the beginning of the, but yeah. In, in any event, I think everybody's looking forward to how things look over at CBP later this week. And yeah, people got used to that right field scoreboard and that's just the way the world more ad space. It means maybe that, that, uh, that old scoreboard washing might be a little more difficult to do. Can't just look out the right field and see the whole landscape of the league with the pitchers numbers, but Hey, we'll figure it out. Uh, I wanted to just talk about the bullpen too here because it's the one uh, one issue we didn't we didn't discuss here. We talked about like the Jake Cave trade and center field situation with Rojas and the Taiwan Walker injury, but the bullpen most of the year, most of the spring here, we were talking about there being two open spots. Right? We thought that there were six guys who had spots claimed: the three lefties and three righties: Strom, Soto, Alvarado, Hoffman, Dominguez, Kirkering. But Orion Kirkering missed almost all of spring training with the flu. I spoke to him in early March, right when he was kind of getting out of the woods initially of that illness, and he looked great. He said, yeah, I feel great. I threw a bullpen this morning. I think I might be back on the mound in a game in two days, and then it just never happened. So you wonder, like, did he uh, did things go south again for him? I ended up leaving Clearwater the day after that, so I didn't get a chance to catch back up with him. But uh, the bullpen composition, it does look like it's going to include Luis Ortiz, Connor Brogdon, and Junior Marte, three guys who we were not certain were going to make the team. Uh the Phillies are still heavily reliant on those core pieces, and they also extended Matt Strom. So what do you make of this uh, seasoning opening bullpen, Ricky? I, I like the bullpen. Uh, we know Marte throws hard, Brogdon with his fastball changeup combo. I mean, we, we've seen this all before. I think, you know, you bring up those three, and the one guy that interests me the most is Junior Marte. I, I think he's a guy, he throws hard, he's got good stuff. I, I just think kind of putting it all together, uh, for him could could benefit the Phillies. But we're also talking here where what becomes important, sixth inning on. I, I mean, w- when you really look at a bullpen, I think that's that's what pops into my mind. Where Who are your sixth inning on guys? And when you look around Major League Baseball and you look into the Phillies bullpen, I think the Phillies, if, if Hoffman pitches anything like he did last year, beneficial. If If Alvarado throws like he knows how, Awesome. Sir Anthony is the one guy that everybody's going to have those question marks on because it's been peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. He's got to just get to that point where he's comfortable and confident. Um, It could take one game. It could take one pitch. Uh, Relievers are very strange. They're very finicky. Once they have that feel and they throw that one good pitch, the confidence level goes from a 50 to a 100. And I think in Sir Anthony's case, that's all he needs is a little bit of confidence. I think we all know he throws hard. He's got a wicked slider. um, And it's just harnessing that and becoming a little bit more of a pitcher uh, with the weapons you have. I I think very simply, I think that first series could be very, very important for a guy like Sir Anthony. Also very important for a guy like Gregory Soto. I mean, Soto is one of those guys who we know can get people out, but we also know it could be an, a bad inning waiting to happen, and that's the one thing he's got to stay away from. I mean, I, I want to see 80 to five, 80 to 85 percentile pitchers. That means every four to four and a half times they go out of there out of five, I want to see them have decent outings. So I look at the back end of that bullpen, and I think they have that. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but MLB Network ranked the Phillies bullpen the best in all of baseball, which is just like – 2020 feels like a long time ago at this point, doesn't it? The days of Brandon Workman and Brandon Heath Henry. Workman, Brandon Workman. <laughs> Trevajador coming in there in the ninth inning. 
And, um, and don't forget Luis Nicasio, you know, in 2018. Yeah, Juan Nicasio. Yeah, Juan yeah, Nicasio. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, that was the best jersey I saw so far this yeah. year. I, in uh, Fort Myers, the Phillies were playing the Twins one day earlier this month, and there was a Phillies fan wearing a Juan Nicasio jersey seated next to another Phillies fan wearing a Tommy Joseph jersey. So not only do they have – yes, yeah, so not, not only do they have those jerseys, but they made the trip to Fort Myers, unless they live there, but – yeah, great stuff there. I literally um, think they should do that at the ballpark once a year. Have fun, everybody yeah. wear like these Crazy jerseys shit, yeah. that are just, you know, like mine. Yeah, I like <laughs> I mean, that. I like that. I think that would be funny. I mean, people walking around with a, with like a Ricky Otero jersey or something like that. I think that would be funny. I like um, I might have to rock me a Gary Bennett jersey. Isn't that your boy? Gary Bennett. Benny. <laughs> At Team Toyota, they've been selling and servicing new and used Toyotas in your community for over 50 years. And you can reserve your next new Toyota with them today. You'll get a realistic timeline, and even in this crazy market, they won't charge you over MSRP. Or don't wait at all. With over 75 certified Toyotas, including a bunch of RAV4 and Highlanders, you can drive one home today. And you can always trust them to maintain your current vehicle. Their service and collision centers are high-tech, comfortable, and will save you time and money. Team Toyota can help you go anywhere you want, but they'll always be your hometown team. Just visit teamtoyota.net and choose from three locations in Langhorne, Glen Mills, or Princeton. Catch all the sports action and more at Rivers Casino Philadelphia. Whether it's the money line or the pass line, there's something for everyone, including a great sports book. Rivers Casino Philadelphia, Philly loves a winner. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. It's amazing here that we are on March 26th, two days before opening day, and there's still some key guys out there. Like we finally just saw Blake Snell sign, but Spence has been, uh, I know Spence is interested in Jordan Montgomery, huh? Uh-huh. It's crazy. I, I still can't believe this guy's out here. I mean, he just, he's coming off a World Series win last year with the Yank or with the Rangers, excuse me. Um, I guess the report kind of came out earlier that at the beginning of the, at the beginning of free agency, he was looking at an Aaron Nola type deal. Um, that that Noel's got that seven year, one hundred and seventy million dollars, and then kind of now looking at five to one thirty six, and it's obviously not there. Uh, we saw Snell just sign a few weeks ago. Um, where do you think Jordan Montgomery lands? I know the Yanks and Mets seem interested. Um, I know the Phils probably aren't gonna do anything like that, especially just with the money. Um, but this guy just won the World Series last year. Um, had a heck of a season in twenty twenty three. What what is it? Where's this landscape where Jordan Montgomery? is still on the market with two two days before opening day. Well, I think the reason he's still on the market is because of what you just said, that he wanted the Aaron Nola type money at the beginning of the offseason. I think most front offices looked at it like, is this guy actually at that level? He had a very good 2023 season. He was at his best in the playoffs. He had, uh, back in 2022, you know, a good full season split between the Yankees and Cardinals, but he's really only done it like for about a year and a half. Uh, it's not as if he's been a top of the rotation arm. So I bet you a lot of front offices were looking at it like, is this guy worth – $25 million a year. I mean, we were just talking about Taiwan Walker, right? Taiwan Walker parlayed some success at the end of his Mets tenure into a four-year $72 million contract. And there are already a bunch of teams that probably look at that as an overpay or just an, not a contract that's beneficial to a team. Um, the other part of this Montgomery conversation I would just bring up from a Phillies perspective is this guy hasn't pitched now in a while. So if you sign him, if any team signs him tomorrow, right, when's he actually making his season debut? Is that April 30th? Is that a little sooner? Does he? How many starts is it until Jordan Montgomery is actually able to give you five, six innings? And when you're talking about someone who might be looking at a one-year deal or an opt-out after the first year, if you're a team that signs him, that all factors in in terms of the price tag and whether it's even worthwhile to do. Well, five starts. You have to figure he's got to somehow get five starts in. So that's 25 days right there. Um yeah, so I you don't expect him anytime soon. So the one year deal keeps dwindling down, or even a two year deal starts dwindling down. Now it is all about the Scott Boris factor. I mean, tired act, but I'm. It's just one of those things that his guys always seem to have the most trouble when it comes down to it. Now at at the end, um, I I will say this: Jordan Montgomery. You brought it up, Corey, and I think that's a brilliant point. That is he just a flash in the pan? I mean, in reality, you look at all his seasons, they weren't all great. And w when you come up with one huge season and all of a sudden, well, good timing, yes. But I think he's one of those guys where if he doesn't sign 
I don't know what would happen with him next year. I, I don't think he'll be offered much more than he's going to get right now. So I think he's starting to, uh, and I'm sure he's feeling it. He's got to be feeling like he's in that boat that don't let this boat sink now. You know, jump off when you can uh, and and take some kind of an offer because if, if you don't go out and perform this year, you, everything's going to dwindle on you. Yeah, and the Phillies rotation, I mean, even with the Taiwan Walker injury, it is somewhat of a strength when you look relative to the rest of the leagues in terms of the depth of it. They have a top two that's just about as good as anybody else's top two with Wheeler and Nola. Uh, Ricky, we've been talking about Ranger Suarez here the last few weeks just about how we think that he could take a next step based on how uh, smoothly things have gone for him in camp so far. And then there's the big Christopher Sanchez uh, X factor where you want to see, can he maintain what he did last year? Can he build upon it? Uh, Because... It just it's a lot different than it used to be around here where you would look at the uh, pitching staff. You'd see a lot, a lot of holes, a lot of guys who you weren't sure if you could trust late in games. Uh, but, you know, Dave Dombrowski said as the Phillies left camp that he feels good about where their roster is. We've talked about the lack of drama. Um, I don't know. This looks like one of the better rosters in the National League, like Braves, Dodgers, Phillies. Who else? Is there anybody else that even scares you? Is there anybody else that sticks out as, OK, this team could win 90 to 95 games? No. And that's kind of a good thing. I mean, when, when you think about it, because there's a lot of wins to be had out there. And I'm talking for all three of those teams. I, I think the division could flat out come down to who beats who head to head. It really could. I mean, and I know people will look at it. Well, it's a brave series. It's opening up. This doesn't mean that much. Yeah, it does. It could very well mean a lot when it comes down to September. So I, I look at it this way. The Phillies, if they if they get up for these games against the Braves and win series right off the bat, I think it's only it only helps them in the long run in, for the division. Um, but I mean, look deeper. There's not a ton of teams that you you say to yourself, "Oh, we got to go play them." No, there's just not a lot this year. Um, the Mets. I mean, think about them. I mean, they spent all that money last year, and look where they sit now. How, how does that even happen? I mean, to me, it was a new ownership. You thought that they would become that that team that's going to be up there with the Phillies, Yankees, and and you know Dodgers. No, they they have uh, they hit a brick wall in Cohen's what third year, whatever it is. It's his second or third year. That's not always a good thing uh, for a long term thing. I look at American League. I think Baltimore is really good. I think Baltimore is one of those teams that. Number one, new ownership. Probably the new ownership should be completely in there by open. Uh, from what I understand, by opening day, if I'm not wrong, or very early in the season, and those guys are going to be willing to spend, and they already have a very young team that's very good. So and I think that team's only going to get better as time goes on. And Plus, they have they have Craig Kimbrell. They got, they got a future <laughs> Hall of Fame closer, right? He shut the fills down last week. Big <laughs> spring training game. You saw the the change I've got introduced to his That's right. Team. Bryce Stott right. left playing like what the bleep, what the bleep was that? Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, and going back to the NL though, I mean, you have the reigning National League champions who are young, Christian Walker, kinda, Zach Gallon, all those guys, the Dimebacks are still there. Who knows what the Padres are gonna do, right? They went out and added some pitching, but they're still pretty much the same. You have Reese Hoskins Brewers along with the Cubs. Can we see the Cardinals bounce back after a, a season in my lifetime that I've never seen from St. Louis? Mm. Um, right? Like, who who in from the Central are we worried yeah. about? Or, I, you know, are we still worried about teams in the West? I mean, you think about, like, the Cardinals. Goldschmidt and Arenado took big steps back last year after they were both MVP candidates the year before. I just think from watching Arenado, I watch a lot of out-of-market games. He kind of looks like he might be spent at this point. I don't know if it was injury-related last year. I think he had some back issues, but – not the same sort of consistent like ability to drive the ball. He's also taken a step back defensively, Arenado. It, it stuck out to me the last couple of years when the Phillies have played the Cardinals that Alec Bohm has played better defense in those games at third base than Arenado. Grant is a small sample size, and he's a Hall of Famer himself, Arenado. But now nah, you think about like the rest of the NL, the Mets, as Ricky pointed out earlier, things fell apart last year once they lost Scherzer and Verlander. They're two highest paid guys. They clearly aborted the plan. They abandoned ship and – now I think they're kind of looking at like an 80-ish win season unless things break right for them. Um, and then in the West, I'm you know, it's good that you mentioned the Diamondbacks because they still fly over a lot of people's radar. I think it was most people 
uh, feel it was fluky that they made it to the World Series last year, and maybe it was to an extent, but really good young pieces to build around. Corbin Carroll might be an MVP candidate this year. So I was going to say the exact same thing. Yeah, but, but I mean, the Phillies in like the hierarchy of the NL, I put them right up there with the Dodgers, right up there with the Braves. We talked about this last week about whether it matters or not to win the division. I did see JT Real Muto said that it matters to him, that he's sick of seeing the Braves uh, win the NL East. But you know, now we're talking about it from a practical standpoint here because the series is this week, the three-game series between the Phillies and Braves, Wheeler and Strider on opening day. And I don't know. Ricky, tell me if I'm uh, just kind of overrating this a little bit. But based on the fact that you only have four series against these teams and based on the fact that the Phillies don't see the Braves for about three months after this opening series uh, – I'm I'm not saying it's a must win or anything like that, but you're sure you you, you got to take two out of three here. These games are all going to matter at the end of the season. You might be looking at two teams with 99, 100 wins uh, fighting over who gets that by or who doesn't. Yeah, get by. and interesting pitching matchups too. I mean, you brought up Strider, Wheeler. How about Freed and and Nola? I mean, game two. I mean, this is going to be fun. And you know what the the best part I think about this is is that it's in Philadelphia. I think if this was in Atlanta, I don't think you would get that fire that's going to happen at the ball. We all know what, what the ballpark's like on opening day. It's like a World Series game. So, you know, with, with that being behind the Phillies, I think they get that extra little push. I think I think it's an important series. I think every – I'm, I'm one of those guys who believes game one is just as, as important as game 162. Um, as you go on in the season – What's that old thing? You're, you're going to win 60 games, lose 60 games. It matters what you do in those other 42. Um, I, I, I look at it this way. The Phillies are one of those teams that if they get off to a good start, I think that confidence level grows and that whole, what do I say, stigma of losing early on in the season goes away for these guys. Uh, you, you take out the Braves. Let's say you take two out of three from the Braves in the opening series. I think you feel pretty confident that you could go – up uphill or uh you could you could continue to climb at that point you lose two out of three now you're now you're starting to think oh that's okay we're just starting off poorly again that's not the way to go into a season the other thing i've heard and i just want to bring this up is that a lot of people are like well a lot of the big hitters aren't, aren't hitting in spring training you know what that means to me you know how much that means to me <whistles> nothing Big zero, nothing. And the reason why I say that is because these guys don't get as focused as as you can down in spring training. They're all working on stuff. They're all trying to track the baseball. And somebody brought up Nick Castellanos yesterday. Okay, he's hitting 119 in the spring. Big deal, big deal. Because what happens, think about this for a second, in a baseball player's mind, Castellanos comes in and opening day, he goes two for three against Strider, uh, a double, two RBIs. Guess what? Spring training is behind them. Yeah, that, that, that'll do more for quickly, the company. That's how quickly that mentality changes for a hitter. Hey, I got a, I got a random question here. Who do you think hits the first bomb of the year for the Phils? I'm just thinking Schwarber uh, a couple of years ago, first game as a Philly went deep, not surprising. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon, I think it was his first at bat as a Philly mm-hmm. back in 2019, went deep. So, I mean, these guys, we've seen the flair for the dramatic. Who, who, who do you peg for – the first long ball. I'm not sure it happens on opening day. I know they've gotten to Strider before, but man, is he tough when he's dialed in? You know what's funny? Harper had none in spring training, right? Nope. Correct. He goes oppie bomb, left center field Ooh. against Strider. Wow. Like Bellum at the bank style. I have an odd feeling it may be his first at bat. It would. I mean, it wouldn't shock us with with all that Bryce Harper shown that he can do in these big moments over you the gotta years. Got to show him some love. And, just and imagine some love. Imagine the bank. Right. First up out of the year for Bryce off Strider, too. That place would explode. And knowing that he came in with a little back issue, didn't hit any home runs in the spring, really looked kind of off balance. Then all of a sudden Strider. boom! Oh, I like oh. it. I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go Alec Bohm off of a lefty reliever. I'm going to say that Strider comes out of the game and the Braves bring in like a Tyler Matzik or an A.J. Minter. AJ, AJ's lefties. good. A.J.'s good yeah. to elevate one here or there. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh and I'll say that Bohm makes them pay for that decision. How about you, Spence? Who are you picking? I think Casty. I like I like the Casty. Like you said, spring, who cares, right? I, and we were saying, we were kind of talking about it too. I think it got to that point too, or especially over 
when we were down there too, we were asking those guys and, you know, they weren't like, I asked Alec Bowman, he's like, I'm not really tweaking anything anymore. And this was just two weeks ago. They're, they were just ready to come back here. So I think the last th- few springs, I think they're stoked to get back up here. We, we heard it all week and we're over the last two weeks about how they just can't wait to get back to CBP in the bank. I think Nick stays high like he did in the postseason against the Braves last year and takes Strutter Yard. Place goes nuts. Rain or shine, Thursday or Friday, it doesn't matter. I think Cassie goes yard in the fourth inning on Thursday or Friday. Now you're getting some real specific prediction here. Specific, from maybe. But, uh, you know, I wonder I wonder if Brian Snicker's going to enjoy himself here. Oh, he weekend. hates it here. You, do you think his family will? Doesn't seem like he's a huge fan of Why, Philadelphia. That, that brings up a good thing. Why would you say anything knowing <laughs> that you're going in there for opening series? Well, you know what I took away from it was – Locally, whenever someone makes comments like that about the Philadelphia fan base, obviously we're up in arms and right. we defend ourselves and things like that. And we see it from our perspective. But the Atlanta fan base, if you look at how they responded to Brian Snicker saying that, they were fully supportive of him. So it's it, for them, that was just like – that was as much of a rallying cry for those fans as it is for Phillies fans to support their – when they feel like they're talk trash upon, right? So I don't think that – Outside of Philadelphia, people bat an eye when someone makes a complaint like that. It's just that we take a special sort of pride in the uh, fan base per- personality that's been built here. Uh, but it's not surprising that they give it to these opposing teams and opposing managers. I mean, the Braves have been hated here for decades. Do, do you think we see a lot of Braves fans? I know in the playoffs there was a lot that kind of no. came into town, but I don't think opening day, especially with the weather and stuff like that, are we nope. going to see, especially with the manager being like, hey, don't wear anything Braves gear, all that stuff. <laughs> no, no, I mean, the Mets travel well, but like the Braves, in my experience, don't travel nearly as well. Obviously, it's a farther trip up north, and especially, like you said, early in the season. But no, I think that's going to be like 99.999% Phillies fans uh, making as much noise as possible to bother Spencer Strider, who doesn't like the noise. Maybe the Braves <laughs> just need to play in like a silo somewhere. I think that's, yeah. that's, that's what I it think, is. Yeah. I think Snicker did that to take pressure off of his, his team. Really? Put it, put it on him instead. And it takes it takes a little bit of that off of Strider. People forget about, you know, thinking more about this. This is more top of mind. Snicker saying this recently than Strider making the comments about playing in front of no fans. Yeah, I could see that. Managers do that all the time where they kind of subtly play their little game to, uh, to you know, take pressure, like you said, off of the group. And uh, but, you know, I don't I don't know. These Phillies Braves games, we know what to expect. We know what. Wheeler can do against the Braves, and we know that Nola faced them a zillion times. We know that Acuna is the, this dynamic player, and Michael Harris as well, guy who's poised to take a leap. But, um, you know, one Brave who sticks out to me as someone who could determine how far they go this season and determine a lot of stuff in the NL East is Chris Sale. Uh, you know, that, that's who they signed to be their number three starter to help them out in the playoffs. That We've seen the Braves only have two starters in October the last couple of years, and who knows if Chris Sale makes it to October healthy, but – you know, that's probably someone the Phillies are going to see a lot, you know, in, in key spots here. So somebody that they're going to have to get used to. Really, nobody in this lineup has ever faced Chris Sale. So an interesting little wrinkle added to the division race this year. Right. And that's the thing, too. That's when, when Ricky was talking about the, the pitching matchups. I think Sunday with Ranger versus Chris Sale, two guys that are Ranger obviously doesn't not necessarily approve it year, but it is to a point of like, hey, you know, if you want to solidify as your one C in this rotation, I think it'd be fantastic if he can get off to a great start. And then you have Sale, who's coming off all these surgeries with Boston. Obviously, that contract didn't work out towards the back end as well. And now he's with Atlanta. Sunday is going to be interesting. I'm, I'm super excited to see what both of those guys. I know Sale had a heck of a spring. Um, and now Ranger had a full spring, obviously, and a healthy spring that he was he was all stoked about. I'm looking forward to Sunday. Should be yeah, and Ranger year. has a career three ERA in uh, 16 games against the Braves. So, I mean, he's always pitched well against them. Four out of his five seasons, he's been, like, dominant against the Braves. So we know about Wheeler. We know about Nola. It's really impressive when you stack up the accomplishments that these Phillies pitchers have had because the Braves have been, like, the best lineup in baseball all throughout this era. Top guys, you know, up and down. But the Phillies have had the, uh, the pitching to kind of uh, nullify that. Just remember, those Braves, that lineup had – Career years. I mean, up and down the lineup. Can they do it again? That's the question. We're going to see starting this week. I love it. You know, that, that's a really good point, though. I mean, you said that the other day when we were on radio together, Ricky, that are the Braves going to have a bunch of career years? Albies had a career year. Olsen had a career year. Acuna, Murphy. Uh, see, you're right. It was like the entire lineup the same year. You never see that happen. 
It's why the Braves had by far like the most dominant offense statistically last year. But yeah, who knows? Is Matt Olson going to another 55 bombs? Is he going to drive in 140 runs again? Is he going to three, like do all those things he did last year? He really hadn't been that player prior. I'm not saying he can't do it. Just uh, you never know how one year is going to translate into the next. Yep. Closure animation. Ooh. We're waiting. For, we're still waiting for it. We're Good still enough. waiting for it. We'll wrap it up. We got Ricky coming out of the bullpen here too. Um, hey, we're, we're just going to kind of give like season predictions here. I know we've kind of been doing it all year. Um, maybe some over-unders. I kind of want to talk about two. Um, if you were going to name, like I, I had the conversation with a bunch of friends earlier. I think the entire middle of the infield could win a gold glove i think you can have jt you can have ranger or zach win it on the mound then you can have stott and turner you know together and have two gold go- do two gold glove caliber years say that 10 times fast that's um, bold i i think so i i mean i think stott i think stott has a chance to have one of the better years that we've seen uh philly second baseman have you know have a chance to try to get lead the league in average uh with hitting have a gold glove caliber year uh, I'm excited for Bryson Stott. If you if you guys were going to pick a gold glover, we'll, we'll stick away from, from the offense, stick towards the defense. Who's going to win the gold glove this year uh, in this Phillies roster? JT. Well, that's the easy answer. Well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm uh, Castellanos, no. Right. I go to left field, no. Center field, he could, but he's not going to hit well enough to give it to him. <laughs> uh, Turner, I have a hard time believing he's going to ha- – I, I think he's going to have a turnaround – but Ooh. for him to turn it all the way around like that, I think that would be unbelievable. Uh, Harper, not yet. I think Stott could, but for some reason, the national people do not – they don't look at him as a gold glove second baseman. I yeah. thought he would be in the running last year. He wasn't. Well, he, so Stott last year only fell a couple of votes short. He was one of the three finalists. He didn't end up winning. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I mean – the point you made, Ricky, just now about how Rojas isn't going to hit enough to win the gold glove. Yeah. Sadly, that always plays a role. It's like obviously has nothing to do with the award. But I do think that the, the voters, the BBWAA, which I'm a part of, I do think that they've gotten better over the years. Yeah. I remember the, the, the glaring example that sticks out to me is in the, the late 90s when Rafael Palmero played like 15 games at first base and DH the rest of the season and won a gold glove at first base. Yeah, that was pretty must impressive, been, isn't it? must have been 15 awesome games. But yeah. um, you do have to like uh, kind of – earn a reputation as an all-around player before you start winning. But, you know, I think that Bryson Stott can win a gold glove. The defense is there. He's only going to get better. You remember that he moved over from shortstop, so he's been even better at second base than you would have expected. In terms of Trey Turner, I think if the Phillies get average defense, they'd be thrilled. If they get average defense out of Trey Turner at shortstop to go along with the offense because you got to remember last year he was below average defensively. And Turner I think, said I think- I think Bohm has turned into a really good third baseman. Gold glove, not really sure about that yet. No, no. But, I mean, if they can get average defense out of shortstop and third base and they can get what they expect defensively out of Stott, out of JT, out of Bryce, out of Rojas, out of Marsh, that's five positions right there where you might be above average in the field. And, as you said, Bohm's gotten a little bit better. Castellanos has gotten a little bit better. So the glaring weaknesses of a few years ago, Philly's defense, Philly's bullpen – They've really done a good job of correcting those, and they've done a good job of correcting those without like spending a ton of money to do so. Like they spent the money on sluggers, and they spent the money on starting pitchers. They didn't really spend as much money on like defensive whizzes, or um, they didn't go out and sign a, a Josh Hader for an hundred million dollar contract. Yet they were still able to kind of correct two of the biggest problems that had been holding them back. Yeah. So. Yeah, good good thoughts out of that, Spence. Uh, I think the defense is going to be a, a big topic all year because we know this team can hit. We know this team has a deep pitching staff, but uh, it's just making sure that they play clean, fundamental baseball to get where they want to go. Uh, so that's going to do it for this Phillies Talk podcast presented by Team Toyota. Thanks a lot for listening. Opening day is right here, and we'll be back breaking down everything that happens. I'm Corey Sabin. He's Ricky Vitalico, and Spencer McCurcher is our producer. We'll catch you pretty soon.